to another episode of Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. As always, I am here and Clint is as well. How you doing, bud? Good, my man. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, this is our first episode in the fall of 2023 after school started. So um, there's a reason why we waited until about three, four weeks in. Everything is <laughs> whatever's going to happen is happening. Um, and, you know, got my feet under me. All's well on that front. But yeah, uh, I guess tonight I'm the guest. So Clint will be, Clint and I will be discussing the book that's come out since our last episode. And that would, of course, be my False Water Cobra, Baron's Racer, Musarana book. Um, but before we get into that, uh, we're going to do our typical updates. So what's up with you, my man? Oh, everything, buddy. Everything. <laughs> So, I mean, again, it's always a mile a minute out here, um, you know, project after project. So I think we're down to maybe two or three clutches left in the incubator. Dun, dun, um, so yeah. So so most <laughs> of well, what that means is like, OK, good. That's winding down. But that also means the nursery is full. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, and so lots and lots of mouths to feed and um, just did a show uh, What yesterday. Yeah, just mm -hmm. seems like it's already been for a, forever ago. Um, yesterday in Indianapolis, um, that went very well. I always have a good time up there. Uh, but of course, there's the, the show pack, <laughs> the show unpack, the, you know, destroyed nursery uh, that, mm -hmm. that comes with that. And I... Uh, I, I've learned, and I know that I know he listens to this. So I will say, um, kind of set two guys up, uh, my nursery guy and, and um, another one of our associates on putting everything away. And I kind of gave him my system on how I do it and do it speedy. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, there's still snakes to put away. Uh, their shifts uh, ended, and and I'll tell you, I love you, buddy. I'm not mad at you. But you didn't follow the process, so <laughs> I'm going to have to spend some time with them back there uh, after the next show and show them the quicker way to be able to sure. do that. Um, but um, um, as you know, got another big load of uh, animals in. Yeah, um, from, from Doctor Loman himself, he he managed to uh, to talk a couple of his grad students into making what is it a seven hour trip? Is that right? It's like six, seven. It's never really that difficult to talk them into leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it's the coming back. Is that yeah? The uh huh. <laughs> the, the leaving means that they're not doing what your nursery guy was doing. You know, they don't right. have to do their day to day. So. I usually don't have any problem getting volunteers to go to cool places to see cool people. So, gotcha. Well, hey, they I, they brought uh, a lot of king snakes from uh, from Zach, and I also the coolest thing were the falsies. Heck yeah! So I finally got my hands on falsies, and uh, I mean that was just so dang cool. I'm I'm digging mm -hmm. them so much, man. I, I think I messaged you. It was like, OMG, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> these you things did. are so cool. Um, so, so that's been awesome. You know, lots of, uh, lots of snakes. We, we were able to knock that out and get everything sexed, put away with ID cards and all that within just a matter of hours, man. So, yeah. um, so that was awesome. Um, got some, some great kids there, by the way, I, I was really oh, impressed with them. So they, they were good, man. They knew their stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, we got that going on. We had, um, Gosh, what else have we done? Um, so we have that show. I think in two weeks we have the show here locally in Evansville. And then two weeks after that, it's Tinley. We can, yeah, yeah I think two weeks. So boom, boom, boom. And I, I'm going to see you out there, right? Heck yeah. I will be yeah. at Tinley definitely on Saturday. I, I know that I plan on being at Russ Gurley's table from 10 to at least two, maybe late. Maybe longer, I'm not sure, but I'll be signing the book that we're going to be talking about tonight. Ah, so love it, cool. love it, man. So yep. looking forward and, to and there'll be that. a there'll be a West Liberty University contingent. Um, due to the marketing, it being called the North American Reptile Breeders Conference, mm -hmm. that word is clutch because I can go to the people <laughs> at the university and say we're going to a conference about reptile breeding, <laughs> and that's what we do. And, and so, you know, the university is like, oh, yeah, well, of course you need to go to that. And so um, it's pretty cool that I get to bring the, the students out to, to see the other side of herpetoculture from the, mm -hmm. the, the zoo setting that they're oftentimes learning about. So, yeah, that'll be cool. Well played, Mr. Lowe. Yes. Oh, well I, <laughs> I, I take great pride in 
looking at a bureaucratic system and figuring out how to <laughs> navigate it. We'll, 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 be, we'll be politically correct and, call, and say navigate it. So Love it. Love mm-hmm. it, man. Well, good, buddy. Good. What, what's, yeah. so, so what's new in your world? I know, you know, school's back in and that's a, a hectic time for you. So, yeah, um, school started last week of August and I think it's the second week of September when we're recording this. So, um, mm-hmm. the, a lot happened in that last week of August and, and at, I'm the department chair. So I'm the guy that's in charge of all things in the department. And that also means that when Ever anybody has a problem, it automatically becomes my problem as well. And launching a semester is always going to be a pain in the butt. But uh, we are launching a, a new semester with a new president and a new batch of graduate students. So had to do all that. But what's really cool is this year, uh, the mindset of the people around me is kind of awesome. So I have a lot of enthusiasm and positivity, which is pretty cool. But mm-hmm. when all of that normal chaos would be happening that's when the book arrived and we started selling it and everything else so and we're not doing this via amazon like if if you want a copy of the book you have to message me directly or russ Gurley directly uh, so that we can basically recoup the printing cost first so that russ can ultimately you know make russ and i can ultimately make some kind of profit off of this project uh so what that means is no amazon like no distributor no big fancy press it's it's russ and me and me and russ and that is it so kind of doing the management of who bought what and who, where it does it go and did you pay russ and da 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 that's been um a lot of fun that first week <laughs> of school i think i the entire week got about 10 or 12 hours of sleep because i would be working with the students trying to keep everybody going and then around 11 30 to 2 3 in the morning i was messaging people with the book and, and keeping tabs of who bought what in the big old spreadsheet to make sure we didn't mm-hmm. oversell anything. But it's been a very humbling and awesome experience, like we will soon find out with uh, the episode. Um, on the snake front, things are winding down. Um, false water cobras are notorious for double clutching. So we had uh, 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 75 of them for the one student's experiment. Um, now, like, I think 80 more just hatched. <laughs> <laughs> so as I've stated before, and people have taken me up on this, if you are interested in a false water cobra, hit up Metazotics because they have some. Hit mm-hmm. me up as well. Um, because I just want them to move to good homes. That's where, where I am at this point. And if you're listening to our podcast, I'm going to make the assumption that your home is good. So <laughs> you're good people. <laughs> there you go. uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's happening. And then, uh, just trying to get all the king snakes to eat. It's funny. We did the feeding babies episode and I actually listened to our own episode and have now been employing a lot of those things. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've, I I figured out with the king snakes. I had a friend online. His name's Matt Dove, and and he had a clutch of eastern garter snakes uh, that he wasn't expecting. And so I basically said, "Hey, can I have those?" And I got them. And the idea was that you know they they're not going to have parasites. They're newborns. And I went to feed one, and you know, big burly scientist guy here. You know, it's it went down in the tub, and then it came right back up out. And I was like, "There's no way that I can do this. I don't know why I can't do this, but I just can't do this." And so I figured out that if I had the baby garters in a tub with a little bit of water, mm-hmm. and I left them in there for like three hours, their scent got in the water, and then I marinated the pinkies in the water, and I was able to get a lot of those. Um. This is a term of endearment, but little bastards to eat. <laughs> so, you know, I, I uh, just had this conversation today where because we're we're now the gray bands. We've got all yeah. these baby gray bands that we're working with. And I um I there's somebody had made a post in some group just today about that very thing. And so I'm, you know, going through and reading all these mm-hmm. ideas and and whatnot. And um I was talking to Steve, our animal care specialist here about, okay, so here's, the, you know, some of the things we'll go through and try first. And, um, and I told him about once that, and this was years ago, I was probably, 
19, you know, 18, 19 when this happened. And the Eastern black Kings in our area, babies are kind of notorious, you know, lizard eaters. You know, they, they want the little five line skinks. And I accidentally scented, you know, without real, like not even thinking about it. Cause what I did was I had caught a five line skink and I had it in a little deli cup and I was going to set it up in a, you know, another cage or whatever, but it was in there for a day, you know, a little bit of grass yeah. it was in that deli cup for a day. Well, then I turned it loose. Well, I then fed, I tried to feed Eastern, you know, uh. these Eastern blacks in there with a pinky and bam, when, and, and it's <laughs> because the whole thing reeked of, you know, five line uh, skink and, and, you know, their feces, their, you know, yep. uh, urine. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of that same premise of what yep. you're doing. I just didn't realize I was doing it at the time. No, I, I, my outer banks, king snakes are the ones that are just being complete. They just want to die. That's what I've determined. <laughs> they were born to die. I have done everything I can with them. And I watched one through the tub and it started to eat the mouse. Got It could eat the mouse. The, the, the pinky was not too, too big at all. It was more than capable of eating. Because I got red hot, so they were small enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it ate it halfway, and then it did like the most slow, deliberate FU regurgitation <laughs> I've ever seen a snake do. It's almost like it looked out the side of the tub and was like, oh, he's watching. And then yeah, just watch slowly this. but surely. <laughs> and I was like, God bless it. But um, I've gotten about two thirds of the OBX kings have eaten. And then a couple of them are like mm -hmm. pounding now. So uh, we're good to go. But so, uh, so you you just reminded me of just two quick stories involving the same individual <laughs> back there. So um, the, the guy that in, in the nursery, his name's Drew. So Drew, just like you just said, he goes, I just don't understand why some of these snakes just want to die. Yeah. I don't understand <laughs> why they won't eat anything that we're offering, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's because, you know, he, he's still new to this. And I just, I thought that was comical. But uh, the listeners also, you know, just talking about the frustrations with some of these babies. Mm -hmm. So the, the light box is back there in the nursery because that's where most of the animals are that I'm taking pictures of are in the nursery. And I try to have a routine of one day a week. I'm going through and taking pictures of what's ready, you know, to mm -hmm. be put on the website and whatnot. And um, so I'm taking pictures of a few ball pythons uh, this week or last week. And he says uh, he's cleaning some of the Kluber babies. And he goes, are you not taking any Kluber pictures this, you know, this week? And I go, no, I'm going to. I just figured since you were over there cleaning, I'd start on this side. You know, I'll work my way around. He goes, and he's kind of got his back to me. And he says, oh, okay, good. Because it's a lot more entertaining when you're taking Kluber pictures because I'm over here cussing and threatening <laughs> them. <laughs> you know, like, and he just, because I was like, you know, I, I was taking some, um, Nelson milk snake pictures. And I'm like, I have plenty of you. I don't need you. I can end you. You know, it's just not hostile. He's just, yep. that's more like it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, I hear you. No. hundred percent. So, but that's it. And then the only other thing in my world is I, I hatched out my first clutch of Honduran milk snakes. And, um, I kind of got that 10 year old feeling with that. I, I bred them. It was fun to like, you know, do that process, but mm -hmm. that was one of those opened up the tub. Well, and I, well, what was funny is I got, I, I accidentally put them in the incubator wrong. So I thought what I was pulling out was another Florida King snake clutch. So when you open it up and see that orange and red and black and they're huge, yeah. you're not it's like, Ugh. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but no, they were cool. Um, and so I did pick up another male, on Doran because I was on the fence, but after that, you know, it, it, it was done. And I, I, I haven't tried to feed those guys yet, but I'm, I'm praying, given they've been around for a while, that like we talk about, whoever the hell started breeding Hondurans, let the ones that didn't want to eat just kind of go off into oblivion. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the, I actually think now that I'm thinking about, they are the only morphs that I have in my entire personal collection are wow. the Hondurans. Um, wow. And there's some kind of hypo tangerine something. I don't know That's, what they are. Yeah. I know that those words are associated with them. <laughs> I just quite literally looked at those when I was buying them. I was like, you're pretty. That's mm -hmm. why I'm buying you. So mm -hmm. anyway. But yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it for me. Oh, and well, I guess there's one more. And then my my goal was to, on the hognose front, since that's like the next big push for me, I wanted to add at least one species. And mm -hmm. um, 
I can have Easterns in West Virginia, but it's very complicated. So I was just like, eh. Uh, but I have Mexicans, and I got I got very a clutch cool. of those to hatch. Mexicans, Kennerly, are notoriously difficult to get to eat. So I didn't even try with these guys. I just gave them tails and was like, we're, we're, we're going to get you to the point you like to eat and then, you know, introduce some pinky heads and things mm-hmm. like that. And the good news was that I didn't have to do I just had to put the tail in their mouth. And then I did the whole plop on the table and freeze mm-hmm. and all of them scarf those things down. So that was pretty cool. Uh, right but I've got three more clutches, um, one more clutch of Hondurans, one clutch of thorn scrub uh, rat snakes, and then a clutch of eggs that my son put in the incubator, which is awesome. He's 15. But I, I asked him, like, well, what are these? But somebody double clutched. And he goes, oh, I, I, I don't know. So we got a mystery <laughs> clutch in there. <laughs> I have no idea what the hell those things are. Um, I was away on a trip. He was taking care of the animals. He found the eggs. I asked him to go down um, into the racks and, like, show me, like, all right, well, where did you get it from? Um, I know it's probably a Florida king snake of some persuasion. <laughs> so you may be getting Florida king snakes. <laughs> I don't know what kind they are, but they'll just be Florida king snakes. So anyway. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Um, yeah, so, so that's it for me. <laughs> gotcha, buddy. Well, um, you know, everyone, as Zach mentioned earlier, uh, tonight's episode is going to be about him. Zach, the man, Loman. Um, And, you know, it's funny because as we were talking about what episode, you know, what we wanted to do uh, coming up, mentioned to Zach, you know, of course, the the book's been released. And believe it or not, it was kind of like pulling teeth to get the guy to agree (laughs) to do an episode on this because, uh, you know, it kind of felt like, uh, you know, is he he taking advantage of uh, of having the podcast? And I'm like, man, you put a lot of hard work into it. And the whole purpose of this podcast is for us to get information on species like this out and about. So, uh, I mean, we needed to talk about it. We needed to have an episode uh, about Zach, about the book, about, you know, every bit of it. So um, I think that uh, it's certainly warranted and looking forward to to doing this, man. I've I've been lucky enough to get, well, several of the books, you know, already Mm -hmm. um, and and have gotten to do a little bit of reading in it, get get to look through. And I mean, it's, you know, so far I'm, I'm already digging it, man. And thanks. It's uh, it's good stuff. And and it's, ah, it's just so damn proud of you, Mm -hmm. man. It's it's such a cool thing. So (laughs) no, no, man, it's, I mean it, I mean it. Um, well, let's get let's get rolling with it, okay, Zach? Let's. I, sure. I want to start before we get into the book, you know. And I, I know people have been listening for for quite some time, and um, you know, some of this stuff has probably come up in the past. But I guess I just want for for those listeners who haven't been listening from the beginning uh-huh. um, to, to get a little bit more of an idea, you know, of who you are. So now, from Virginia, is that right? Oh, West Virginia. From West Virginia. Okay. Yes. All right. Won't hold that one against you. Yeah, um, that's okay. Guy from <laughs> <laughs> on the border. Yeah. I'm on the okay. border. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it. Okay. So, so Virginia, I, I'm guessing like any of us who are this big into it at this point, you grew up enjoying reptiles. You, you oh, God, yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, when West Virginia, what did you catch? What was that, that reptile that you were always – grabbing that's a great question so i am from the northern panhandle of west virginia and and that really does matter uh, first of all like 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 you said a lot of people will, will the default is virginia because it's such an important state mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you know when we're from west virginia the running joke is that we always say no we don't have a relative in richmond <laughs> which is the state capital of virginia uh, but within west virginia west virginia is a very unique state we definitely have our own culture here and um, the panhandles are kind of unique within the uniqueness of West Virginia. So I'm in that little part that's sandwiched between Ohio and, and Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. It Geographically, we should have been part of Pennsylvania, but Virginia back in the day wanted to get as much of the Ohio River as they possibly could because the Ohio River is was like the transportation portal. Mm-hmm. So Wheeling is where the, the greater Wheeling area. Technically, I grew up in a little town called Glendale, which is where Brad Paisley's from. Ah. Um, yeah, Brad Paisley's mother was my fourth grade teacher, which is kind of an interesting little That's fun That's very fact. cool, yeah. Yeah, but the panhandle's weird because the central part of West Virginia – has some pretty cool herps. 
But the northern part of West Virginia, it has some cool species, but it's kind of what I always refer to with my students as like the standard northeastern herps. So like we got like five snakes, three turtles, 10 salamanders. And so for me, a, a big deal snake for me back in the day would have been a black rat snake, uh, mm-hmm. which in other parts of the world of, of the U.S., now that I travel so much, you know, you trip over five in a day, but I might find two or three in a summer. So that would have been a biggie. Mm-hmm. Um, Eastern garter snakes and and have always been an important species for me. But my favorite snake, it's still my favorite snake today, uh, were water snakes. So I've always been drawn to streams and rivers. Mm-hmm. Duh. Dr. Mm-hmm. Crawdad mm-hmm. makes a whole lot of sense. And um, I love things that want to bite you. So Nerodia... <laughs> Common water snakes were it for me. I, if, if I could get my hands on a great big female, uh, common, we call them Nerodia here at school, so that's what I'm going to call yeah, them. Yeah. Um, that was like, that was it for me, you know. And then copperheads were these legendary beasts that, yeah, they are so flipping rare in this part of the state. And in, in, in the southern central part of West Virginia, they can be the most common snake you find. So mm-hmm. um, to me, that would... You know, that was like the the penultimate. And it took me, oh, my goodness, I think 12 years before I found my first panhandle copperhead. So so that was a species for me. And then salamanders. I did a lot of stuff with salamanders as well. Very cool. Yeah, I, I think on my end, it was like you said, it, well, now they're gray rat snakes in yes. my area. They were black rat snakes all my life until <laughs> they weren't. Um, mm-hmm. But those, yeah, those are so common in my area. Yeah. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I think I may have even said this before that my phone will auto populate because I get pictures <laughs> of them sent to me so much that if I type in BL, it'll mm-hmm. say black rat snake because I'm constantly yeah. telling people that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, that the pinnacle for me was, is the Eastern black Kings in mm-hmm. our area. Um, it's yeah. not that they're uncommon. I just, just not as common as, you know, the, the black rats, at least you don't find them as much, but man, they're, you know, that the beauty. Oh, they're them. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and, and Nick, on that same point, I grew up in Wheeling where we have like five snake species. Mm-hmm. Then I did my master's degree at Marshall, which is in Huntington, which is southern West Virginia, right on the Ohio River. Mm-hmm. And I was just completely gobsmacked when I lived in Huntington for two years. Because in my mind, like West Virginia wasn't a snaky place. But then I get down to Huntington and there's flick, there's black rat snakes. Sorry, there's a uh, black kings. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've got my lifer in a little town called Barbersville. There were rough green snakes, which blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. Copperheads were freaking everywhere. Like whenever I would go into an abandoned house and flipped in, uh, to me, a copperhead was like the rarest thing on earth. And here, mm-hmm. it was so hard for me to grasp this concept that you could find like ten in a day. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no. I, it, yeah, but up where I'm at, we're kind of not in a very reptile heavy area, unfortunately. Yeah. Same, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. We got about five that I see all the time. That's it, you know. Um, well, it, you know, so you, you grew up, you know, catching those, looking for those. Now, was it just you and your family that enjoyed this uh-huh. kind of thing, or was did, was there anybody else that? It was just me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I get yep. it, man. I get it. <laughs> no, and I had. My parents were both teachers, so teaching become is a very natural. I tell everybody like that's the family business, and uh, my poor mother, man, she went through absolute flipping hell because she is scared to death of creepy crawly things, and <laughs> that's all I wanted to do was bring the like. It wasn't good enough to find them; I had to find them and bring them home. Like they they had to come home, mm-hmm. um, and so then I would set them up in home, and then they would escape. And mom had rules, but I just didn't care. That's kind of how that went. And mm-hmm. and so uh, one of my most vivid memories from when I was, I think I was nine or 10, I had found a couple garter snakes in the backyard. And I had, my dad built me this thing to house insects based off of a little thing called a bug box that you could buy at Cracker Barrel or something. He just built me a big one. And so it had screen and he stapled the screen onto it well you know if you picture the space between a staple um that is about the most perfect thing for a snake to escape out of so i was Mm -hmm. convinced that this was like escape proof and i put those two big female garter snakes in there and they were out within i think they were in out less than i had them in there for an hour they were gone Mm -hmm. and then you know (laughs) you kind of do that thing when you're a kid we're like oh god 
am I going to find them? Is mom going to find them? And it was mm-hmm. about five days later. I was, we, we grew, uh, my parents had a home out a Creek and my dad and I were down in the Creek. And then, uh, I heard my mother, I thought she was on the front porch. She was actually in her bedroom and I was half a mile <laughs> away <laughs> and she was yelling, Zach, Zachary James Loafman. She threw the middle name in there. Mm-hmm. You better get your little dumb ass up here now. <laughs> and I said to dad, she found the snakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was like, you were dumb enough to bring snakes in the house. And I was like, I needed to. So, you know, <laughs> and, and now it's fun because that's my wife that does that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so anyway. It, 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 you, if you are the owner of the animal, you are not the one that's going to find it. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, uh-huh. it's it's funny how I'm in the mirror right now, yes. Zach, uh-huh. because yes. I just <laughs> made a post uh, on Metazotics like last week or the week before asking people about kind of – we talk about escapes because it happens to every mm-hmm. one of us, right? And what's kind of that most memorable one? And for me, it was the same thing. I uh, had one get out, you know, whenever I was a kid. Um and it had been out for a few days. I didn't tell mom. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> never tell. You them. never tell. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> you smart. hope you're going to be yeah. the one to find it. Uh-huh. But it doesn't work that way. And uh, how did I know when I was about to get my snake back was she went to do laundry and clat, you know, yeah. Yeah, with, like every eye, you know, in my name yep. just held that eye mm-hmm. for so long. Yep. Um, and sure it was coiled around the lip inside the washing yep. machine when she opened that lid. There it is. So it's kind of like a Jack in the box pop, you know, up. So yeah, but yeah that's, I, I can fully visualize it Zach, oh, yeah. because I've no. lived it, my friend. I get but, it. But, but my, my parents are the reason I am the way that I am. Like I had ex- <laughs> exceptional parents growing up mm-hmm. and they, they put up with, with me being me and they knew they always said that they, they knew that whatever the hell this was with me, that it was not just a phase. Like a lot mm-hmm. of people, like I had a dinosaur phase until third grade and then I still do. Who doesn't? Who, who didn't? Yeah. You know what I mean? They're all over right. my office here, yeah. by the way. Um, but it was just, I couldn't find them. That was the one thing you can't, you know. So mm-hmm. as soon as I realized that I could go out and find snakes and turtles and, and everything else, that's when the, there was like an almost immediate transition. Gotcha. Um, but no, yeah. uh, they, they put up with a lot um, and they supported it and nourished it. And now I am who I am because of that. So. Well, and I think that, you know, that's another thing I was lucky into lucky with as well is it wasn't so much of a, of a nourishment, but they I didn't grow up next to a creek. I grew up next yeah. to the projects. You know, <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't the best neighborhood um, mm-hmm. or, or part of town. And. But when it came to reptiles, I mean, that was something that I wanted books. I wanted, you yep. know, I, learning. And so my mother, it, she's said it my entire life. She says it to this day because she's never been a reptile person. But she says there was much worse you could have gotten into. That's what my mom said. And that's, yeah. No, it, so. this is funny on that exact same line of thought. I was 18 or 19 and I was on family vacation with my my mother. And uh, I was begging to have the, the, the vehicle we took on vacation, uh, because I wanted to go road cruising, uh, along coastal North Carolina. And I had found my first rattlesnake on that trip and made the fatal mistake of coming home excited, talking about the cane break that I'd found. And my mom knew what that was because she was raising me and she looked me dead in the eye and was like, can you just go to a freaking club? Can you go get drunk? Can you go do anything? <laughs> <laughs> deal with the freaking caught mouths and the rattlesnakes. Like I just, just don't. And so then I said, well, you can go with me joking. <laughs> and mom was like, fine. And so I took my wow. mom cruising uh, <laughs> and we went out, you know, but that was just the kind of parents that I had, uh, which is like, and, and she, she was a trooper. Now, of course we didn't see a freaking reptile on that. Uh, we saw black bears and otters, nutri, like all these mm-hmm. mammals, which, mom liked i didn't like but um but once she went out and realized like okay he knows what he's doing and she backed down but and now you know i'm 44 i go all over the u.s Mm -hmm. and 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 all over you know central america now and and even to this day i'll call her 
and she'll be like, do you still have all your fingers? Like, that's what <laughs> you lead the conversation with. I'm like, yes, I do. You know, I, I've got this group of 20 year olds with me that I'm in charge of, but your mom's always your mom. So, Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. You, you know, know, talking about how they <laughs> kind of support you on it, even when it's mm-hmm. not something necessarily they support. I think the the thing that stands out the most for me was there was a an adult corn snake at the local pet shop that I wanted. And I don't know, I was probably 13 maybe. And, you know, I really wanted it and she's no, no, no. And my birthday was coming up. So I'm, you know, really saying this, no, 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 no. You know, you don't need this snake. Well, I come home one day and I don't know what it was, but I got into it with my mother and my stepfather and, you know, I'm super angry, you know, throwing a fit, stomping down to the basement where my bedroom (laughs) was, you know, and I mean, we're, we're, you know, yelling and whatever. I'm slamming doors. I get into my bedroom and there's a brand new tank set up everything oh. up with this corn snake <laughs> in my bedroom. And I'm just, I'm sitting there staring <laughs> at it now. Like, I love that it's here. I'm so happy to have it. But I know I'm still so angry at whatever it was we were arguing about. So I know if I, you know, I, I have to, I have to be grateful. But then if I go up there and be grateful, then it's just whatever it was they did to make me mad is okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it was just one of those where it's like, you know, just that angry yeah. little kid that mm-hmm. doesn't want to smile. Don't smile. You know yep. what I mean? Kind of thing. So, but funny stuff, man. Funny yeah. stuff. So uh, do you remember what your first snake was? Was oh, it yeah. Garters? Um, well, I mean, the first legitimate snake, those were Ill- illegitimate because I wasn't supposed <laughs> to have them. Um, <laughs> that, the first snake I got is also kind of funny. Um, my, my my parents were got divorced, and so I had dad and stepmother, and then I had my mom. And my mom was – I mean, she's your mom. She was my mom, so she basically knew the reptile thing wasn't going, around, going away anytime soon. And so at – mom's house i could have pretty much whatever i wanted except snakes through high school so i had a mm-hmm. crap load of lizards uh i had mangrove monitors savannah monitors a big ass iguana because that's smart um and i had a bunch of lizards and high school graduation was coming up and mom kept saying like what do you want for graduation and i knew like this was an angle that i could work to get the snake in and so i just dug my heels in and was like the only thing i want is a snake And she rather famously talked to my grandfather and was like, we'll get you a car. But I already knew I had a car coming, a very crappy car from my dad's side. And so uh, I was like, nope, I just want a snake. So my first snake was a corn snake. uh, And it was the anti-corn snake corn snake. Um, That that thing wouldn't eat to save its life. It it didn't like I, I have had so many corn snakes. I've made a ton of corn snakes corn snakes eat this thing didn't uh so i ultimately ended up returning it to the pet shop and that i did all my you know herp stuff with Mm -hmm. and then i traded it in for a bull snake (laughs) and i love that that bull snake was your classic pissed off angry at the universe bull snake that rattle hiss that they get to do yeah um Mm -hmm. and so that that's the one that i kind of consider the first the, the real first snake if that makes sense and then I got to college and my advisor, who I refer to as Mr. Gordon, um, he was like my second grandfather. He basically he was a snake guy, too. And he told me, like, this zoology lab, fill it. And that was that was that was pretty awesome. So uh, as long as I told him what I was getting, uh, he didn't care. But I had to get the feeders and do all that. So when I was in an undergrad, I had pythons and and colubrids, and that's when I really got into monitor lizards. I had a ton of monitor lizards, blue tongue skinks, and I liked the oddballs back then. So mm-hmm. um, I remember I got these. The, the herp show I went to all the time was the All Ohio Reptile Show in Columbus, and it's one of the longest running monthly shows. And uh, there was an importer there that had these things that he was calling uh, Chinese garter snakes, and I knew that they were some kind of keelback because natricids were always something I was into. And so I bought them and then I found out that they were like extremely venomous, 
<laughs> like, like I had bought like four of the damn things. I, I, I don't think it was Tigrinus, but it was one of the really nasty, gnarly um, Asiatic keelbacks. Wow. And, and so when I had those situations, Gordon uh, would be like, OK, this one's going in the closet. And so he gave me a key and I had a back room. And then, you know, that's where those animals went. But um, one of the best things about my life. This is like full circle, have these little moments to myself all the time. And since I teach in the same building, I got my undergrad degree in. I would daydream about what I would do with that room when I was like 19 or 20. And now I do that to the room. Like the best thing I've done is where I took chemistry three times because I couldn't pass <laughs> chemistry. Um, when Zeus I needed a home, the first thing I did is I targeted the chem lab. We chemists moved out and I destroyed the chemistry lab uh, that I loathed, hated and despised. As an, it was like one of the most cathartic things I've done. And when I say destroy, like I was up there with the sledgehammer knocking down the lab to make room for the enclosures. So, um, but yeah, no, that's basically been it. Uh, so I want, cause that was actually my very next question to you because in the book, you know, I, I read that piece and that, like, I guess I want to explore one how that conversation went when, because that's literally got to be the dream of anyone that is into what we're into and is working in the field uh -huh. you're working in to have a university tell you, <laughs> go build the, the herp department, go yeah. fill it. I, I mean, it's like, you know, oh, yeah. you're right. You know, yep. you got a blank check mm -hmm. to do whatever yep. the hell you want. And I'm like, so when I read that, I wanted to know, you know, what that, how did that happen? How did you get tapped for it? Sure. How, how did it come about? And, and what was like your first month with that yeah. project? Well, what's weird about it is it was like a bittersweet thing. So I got hired at West Liberty in 2006. I did not have a PhD. I had no desire to be Dr. Loafman. I'd said to, I don't know how many people, like, I, don't, I just don't want to get a doctorate. Um, and I came back to West Liberty because at the time, that guy I was just talking about, Mr. Gordon, he had retired uh, two years before that, maybe a year before that. I don't remember exactly when he retired, but like the, the running joke was it, when Gordon retires, Zach needs to come back and fill his shoes because he was my mentor. And I mm -hmm. fully embraced everything about his way of teaching, his the classes. I took every single class he offered. He was an absolute... Uh, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but his tests were just total. They were just bitch. They were horrible. <laughs> um, and I and I, you know, everybody else would be like, oh, God, we're going to get our asses kicked. And I was like, bring it. Let's go. Like, you know, because I've been a nerd my whole life. And this was like the Super Bowl for me. Uh, I, I, I couldn't play football. I didn't have an athletic bone in my body. But you put an ecology test in front of me and I wanted to get an A on it. So nice. anyway. So um, I came back after I got my master's at Marshall. I got my master's in a herpetology lab, but I also found the crawdads while I was down there. And professionally, I was heading in crawfish were, were what I was going to study. So I got out of herpetoculture entirely. And slowly over time, um, over the next nine years, we were slowly but surely building what's called organismal biology here at West Liberty. And when I say, like, I'm not talking about Duke or Virginia Tech level building. I mean, we went from like, two people who graduated and want to be a field biologist to like 10 people that graduated and want to be a field biologist. But it was for us a nice steady growth. Mm -hmm. And we had reached a point where we realized that we needed more professors. I couldn't be the only professor doing this anymore. Meanwhile, in the interim of that, I was a psychopath and got my PhD while working. And I started that like two months after my son was born. So I learned in that wow. process I can do anything if I put my mind to it because I literally had to. And the only reason why I got the PhD, I don't want people to think that like I wanted, wanted to do this. I was told by my <laughs> boss, um, we're becoming a university because we were West Liberty State College. And when you go from college to university in the United States, you have to have a certain ratio of faculty members that have what's called a terminal degree. And the only thing that was keeping us from making that transition is we didn't have enough terminal degree faculty members. And mm. so if you didn't have the PhD, you were basically told when we became a university, you have three to four years. If you don't have it, 
you're losing your job and we're replacing you with somebody that has a PhD. So that is why I got my doctorate. It wasn't, you know, because I aspired to get it. And, and I think that's also part of the reason why I'm so down to earth with it because mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't want to go to the ivory tower. I'm like a blue collar academic. That's what I tell everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, I got my degree, you know, I could basically lead things. We got majors and we had hired a couple people and they didn't quite work out. And so they had left and we needed to hire somebody else. And I had a guy that I worked at the local zoo with named Joe Greathouse. And he was now Dr. Greathouse. Mm-hmm. And he was doing an hour commute and he studied hellbenders. And I thought, oh, my God, I got to get Joe. Like, you know, he's he's now Dr. Joe. We can hire him. He can fill one of these voids. And he lived 10 minutes down the road from the school. So I knew he would want to be here. And so I you know, called him up. And sure enough, he said, no, I would definitely jump on that. So we hired him. Well, Joe had been at Ogilvy Good Zoo for a very long time. And I'm talking within 12 hours. It wasn't 24 hours. Within 12 hours of him in an official capacity, he said, hey, we tried to do this thing called a zoo science major with one of the local schools when I worked at the zoo. It didn't work out. I've kind of figured it all out. Would West Liberty be interested in that? And one of the things I love about my school is we're like the little engine that could. Like we just fling ourselves off cliffs and we are free falling at full velocity (laughs) towards the earth. (laughs) But we're just like, we, you know, the whole time. (laughs) And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And then I didn't take much, but I talked to my chair at the time and she said, yeah, let's do it. And so we worked with Joe. We worked with Ogilvy Good Zoo um, and very rapidly got this major up and running. And so initially the idea was that I was going to be the field person because I was doing all the crayfish stuff and I was building a name for West Liberty in crayfish conservation. And then Great House was going to run this zoo side thing that I didn't know anything about. And then we were going to have like, you know, this nice little bubble of organismal biology that we would be known for. And what ended up happening is Joe is really good at his job. And over the summer of 2016, um, he was going to be a professor in charge of zoo side. That's when he infamously was approached by his old employer, which was Ogilvy Good Zoo. Um, he worked at the wilds when, when we kind of grabbed him for West Liberty, but he had worked at Ogilvy Good Zoo before that. And they basically said, Hey, we need a director and a director of a zoo makes a little bit more money than a professor. Um, and so he actually came to me and we had this conversation. He was like, so, uh, I think I'm going to bounce to the zoo. And at the time, this is the bittersweet part. Cause at the time I was like, What? Like, cause I knew what was going to happen. I knew immediately what was going to, I, I knew that if he bounced to the zoo, we don't have anybody else to do this zoo sci thing. And I am going to be the guy doing zoo sci and I don't have the credibility to do zoo sci cause I'm a field based ecologist and I haven't worked in a zoo since I was 19. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and then mm-hmm. the other thing that needs to be said is I had gotten my first sabbatical to write a book, The Crayfishes of West Virginia, <laughs> in the fall of 2016, when we were launching the Zeusai major. Like, I, I intentionally was going to leave so Joe could launch Zeusai. And, and, and so what ended up happening, of course, we're not going to say no, because now the director of the zoo is also a faculty member at West Liberty. Like, that's too good mm-hmm. to be true. Mm-hmm. And exactly what I thought was going to happen <laughs> is what happened. And so I think it was like three weeks before I'm supposed to, like, go off – and write about crawdads for three months and not be interrupted. We're about to launch this incredibly unique major. And so in the negotiation process, which lasted all of 10 minutes, <laughs> basically I, I, I said, like, I'm being voluntold. I'm doing this right to my boss at the time. And she looked at me and was like, yeah, absolutely. That is what's happening. And I said, well, if that's what's happening, I get to be in charge of the animal collection. Cause I, I cause I have to have something that I can focus on that's like positive because this is going to eat up my sabbatical and I am not going to be writing this book. And, and my chair said to me, Oh no, you'll have plenty of time to write the book. I didn't write a word of that book <laughs> for the next four months. And we launched Zusai and it was, it was crazy uh, because it dawned on me like, okay, so the 20 year old version of me who used to be in, in Arnett hall is the building we're in. And think like, man, that room would be awesome to turn into a blank for a blank. I can do that now. So if I'm going to enjoy this, 
that's what we're doing. And I just thought to my head, well, I've always wanted a water monitor. I bought one within an hour, like <laughs> within, within an hour of having this title. I went on to Fauna. I found a captive born um, macro, macro maculatus, which are the really pretty water monitors from South America or not South Jesus from Thailand. Uh, I bought that. I was into geckos at that time. Cause that's what I got back into uh, mm-hmm. herpiculture with. So I called up some people that had leeches and I was like, I want four. So boom, you know, and when we got the, the GT leeches, if you know what those are, those are the big mm-hmm. ones, not the little yeah, ones. Yeah. Um, and so I basically started to like build the collection and I didn't have any help. I was a one man army. Like it was, the first person who took care of the animals uh, was somebody that was sticking around to be my grad student because the grad program was going to start in 2017. So I was paying this person to like be a crayfish technician. And then I was like, hey, you've got to take care of all these animals, too. Uh, and then the thing we don't ever talk about is that we had we had a sloth. Um, and so I became a sloth dad. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the thing that people don't know about sloths, which – I like things that are cranky, cantankerous, and bite. Mm -hmm. Sloths, when they're little, bond with like three or four people. And if you're not one of those three or four people, they will bite the hell out of you. Uh, And so we got a sloth. That's the – if anybody goes online to look at our program, the – the um, logo is a sloth hanging from Zeus eye. Mm-hmm. So we knew we had to have a sloth. We knew that that was a mammal that we could actually take care of here. So we went in with the zoo and, and purchased a sloth, but I quite literally was a sloth. I say sloth dad, but in reality I was a sloth mom because sloth dads don't do any parenting. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, one of my favorite moments of that of starting Zeus eye is I remember being online looking up animals that we were going to be getting I had sloth stuck to my chest while this is happening. <laughs> um, and I was running the, the shower in my bathroom because we had to get humidity for the for the sloth. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, OK, this is my life now. And then, you know, since then, we've gotten more organized, obviously. Now we have a staff of like five. Um, Zusai has gone from the initial cohort and we had 24 kids in it. Uh, now we're the largest major on campus. I found that out this past fall. Wow. I did not know that that was – it's funny because I don't like meetings and I was in this meeting trying to be a player, like a team player, <laughs> listen to what's going on. And um, I actually think that I was scrolling through King Snakes on Morph Market <laughs> and I heard uh, Zeus is now the largest major on campus. It finally took the lead over nursing. And that's when I realized, like, holy crap, wow. I'm the chair wow. of the department of the largest major on campus now. So um, and we've got the grad students, the zoo collaborations. But as part of that. I felt like I need to have something academic and tangible that like validates my existence in this role. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's, it isn't, I said this in another podcast, it is not a case of imposter syndrome. It's more, I just feel like if I have this opportunity to pursue this aspect of my life professionally and academically, Mm -hmm. and I don't fulfill the 19 year old version of me's like, number one dream in life then i'm not honoring that part of me and so that was Mm -hmm. that was a major part of it and it wasn't like just to write a book on snakes because i need to because now you know i've done something in herpetoculture in an academic setting so i'm not just talking about all the time i actually have something under my belt fantastic man (laughs) fantastic well, let's start to move in that direction a little bit before we jump straight to the book I i guess we need to understand kind of how you got to the book's topic. So yeah, I sure. guess what I want to 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 hear about is Lily. Lily. Hear about Lily. Yeah. All right. And, and yeah. how that came to be and and you know what happened from that point. So. Sure. So uh Lily is actually short for her actual name which is Lilith because of her insane feeding response. But uh I don't name snakes. The only snakes that I name are the false water cobras because they have so much freaking personality, like an animal like that needs a name. That's just mm-hmm. basically nice. where I'm at. But what I was doing is in that same fall that we're talking about, 2016, we're about a month in. It was actually probably October, November of that fall. I was trying to figure out like what direction are we going to go with the collection? And I wanted uh, – I did not want to have a, what I refer to as a Petco collection. Like mm-hmm. our competitors were – 
that had other, uh, other small universities that had Zeusai schools. Or sorry, I said that totally backwards. Other small university Zeusai schools, there we go, uh, that had animal collections, that's what they had. And so I wanted to kind of be unique. And I knew that I had this, the knowledge and skill set to take care of some more advanced stuff. So I was trying to find snakes that when I would learn about them, they they seemed to be kind of easy to take care of, but were not that common. And I thought if we pick some of those, we could basically take care of these animals, write the book on them, mm-hmm. um, and then establish ourselves as, you know, that's one of West Liberty's strengths. And my favorite animals are things that live in swamps. Even though I love the Appalachian Mountains and with the crayfish, I study a lot of mountain ecology and animals that live in mountains. I would be lying to myself if it wasn't creeks, rivers, and swamps. Like, that's where I want to be. Mm-hmm. And so aquatic snakes are it for me. But most aquatic snakes don't do well in human care unless you give them you know, a lot of room and a lot of ventilation and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And so I was going through the oddball part of fauna and up pops false water cobra. And I knew what that snake was because when I was 1920, I would see them occasionally at the Columbus, Ohio show. And I distinctly remember the first – one of the first ones I saw was in a big Rubbermaid tub. And I like peeked in at it and it did this crazy thing where it put up the big hood and then it headbutted the, ta- the tub. <laughs> uh, and I was like, did that thing just headbutt the tub? It wasn't a strike. It used its head like a club to bash the side of the, the tub. So, you know, that's a perfect animal for naive 19-year-olds to work with. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, absolutely. Uh-huh. So I, 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 I saw the, the falsy and basically was like, OK, I've got to, you know, I have to honor myself here. So I'm going to investigate this to get it off the list. And so I was trying to find information about their care. I couldn't find anything. And so I basically looked on Facebook and found there were actually two groups, False Water Cobra. Cobra, sorry, is one of the Facebook groups. And then the False Water Cobra is another one. And I was kind of, you know, patrolling both of those groups, totally expecting to see they're like a timber rattlesnake. Um, They're aggressive. This is not a snake that you should keep ever. They die. Like, you know, that's what was known about them in the early 2000s, late 90s. And I'm seeing like the polar opposite. And people are talking about the fact that these things are smart. Uh, They're their favorite snake in their collection was a reoccurring theme. Uh, I was seeing how big they were, and I wanted something that was sizable. I did not want something that was small and diminutive. And and so, you know, I thought, okay, well, crap. I, I, uh, I'd be lying to myself if we're not going to get one of these, so let's just <laughs> accept that that's about to happen. Um, and so I went looking deeper, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to have that at the school. Uh, so I found a guy who had an old post and – I saw Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh's an hour from where I live. So it, it was far enough back in fauna where you'd put your phone number on the ad. So I called the guy at like 10 30 at night and he picked up uh, and I basically said, you got any false water cobras? And he said, I have one female left. Um, and you know, if you wonder, you're going to have to act cause there's two people that are nibbling. And I said, okay, I'll buy her. Where do I, what do I need to do? And classic herpetoculture move. Well, you got to come up to my tattoo shop and go back. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so, you know, never been in a tattoo shop before. Um, nothing, no, nothing I have anything against that. But and so I drove up and I bought Lily and she was um, just fantastic from like from the second I got her, she hooded mm-hmm. and she did not bite, but she would whip her tail. She would smack things with her head Um she would musk all over you and I put her in a tub with a heat mat. And then (laughs) I distinctly remember the first time I fed her, I opened the tub and thought, Oh crap. Cause I didn't see her. Uh, I had about an inch and a half of, um, reptibark in there from the zoo med stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I was holding the mouse with the tongs and I was actually using the tongs to kind of move the mulch away to see if she was down in there. And she shot like a bullet up out of the mulch, grabbed the mouse, and then hit the ground and just started slapping the mouse against everything around her. And then I was just giggling like a 10-year-old. <laughs> like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Um, and it was one of those moments that will forever be etched in my brain. 
because I thought if she does that one more time, this is my snake. And the next time I fed her, she did the exact same thing. Um, and then it was, it was on at that point. Like we, I, I talk about this in the book and it's not an exaggeration. Like I knew that second false water cobras are going to be a part of my life for the rest of my, my life, because it was like the full package for me. Uh, and they have actually exceeded my expectation. Like mm-hmm. what I thought about them in that would have been January ish of 2017 um, compared to what I know now in 2024. Uh, it, it's so much better than what I thought it was going to be. And and now here at the school, you know, I tell everybody I have a false water cobra problem. Um, there's, there's eight adults here. And then I think I have six adults at my house. <laughs> All of them are in big cages. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the smallest enclosure that the adults are in is a six foot long viv. The, wow. At my house, I've got these eight foot by three foot deep by two foot tall um, PVC enclosures. We have built the sloth enclosure. Uh, we got rid of the, the sloth went to the zoo. And then uh, before anybody could say anything, false water cobras moved in. <laughs> so, you know, they're, yeah, but, but no, they have, and as a scientist, they are amazing when it comes to their behavior. Cause they're so freaking complex with their cognitive ability that we can actually do science with them and get results that you can test with stats and, and everything. And, uh, I have one kid that graduated with their master's thesis focused on false water cobras. I have another one that's supposed to defend, uh, this fall where false water cobras were part of their thesis. And I got a third who are studying boldness in um, and its relationship back to parentage in, in, in these animals. So, wow. yeah. So they're very, perfect. very cool, man. Very mm-hmm. cool. Love it. Yeah. Well, so now we know why. Mm-hmm. Now, now we know why falsies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, definitely a passion project, no doubt there. So let's let's start talking about the book, man. Let's. Yeah. What was the process for writing this book? Like, what what did that look like? So, the actual first, you have to get somebody interested in the book. You don't have to do that, but I wanted to make sure that we had somebody interested in the book. So, you know, I, I've said this on this podcast, other podcasts, but initially. This book was supposed to be part of the Hognose Snake book that I am going to be writing. Um, it was supposed to be Hognose Snakes and their allies, and this was the allies part. And the idea was I was writing a Hognose Snake book so I could write about false water cobras. That was basically what was going on. Not that I don't love Hognose Snakes, but I could get those guys in. And I wrote the first chapter on – which was on Museranos, which are also related – and, and it was like 50 or 35 pages long, um, one and a half spaced font. So if you make that double space, probably pushing 45, 50. Then I wrote the false water cover chapter and it was just immense. And so I realized at that point, this is its own book. And so I used this book to learn how to write a book. That's basically what my, that was one of my like ulterior motives with this mm-hmm. process. Like learn the process of writing a book and, and, and getting a book to publication. Um, and so that's where Russ Gurley comes into play because he was willing to take a gamble on it. And thank God he did. Uh, but for actually writing the book, um, uh, as a scientist, you know, I'm taught to do this thing called a literature review, which is kind of like writing a report just on speed. So you, you don't just get like 20 sources and quit. You have to dig and dig and dig and dig and try to find every little piece of information you can get. So I did that. I used Google Scholar. I used a bunch of like academic resources I have. One of the big problems was a lot of the papers were in Spanish and Portuguese. I don't speak Mm -hmm. either. So I got really good at like select all copy and then dumping it all into Google Translate and then trying to like navigate this translated from Portuguese into English bit of nonsense and try to figure out like what are they actually saying here? Because sometimes it would translate well and other times it did not. Mm -hmm. And so I just spent a lot of time doing that. Um, I reached out to anyone and everyone. So we talk about the snake identification groups here in the States. Mm -hmm. Uh, I joined on social media, the Argentina snakes identification group, Paraguay snake identification group, the Brazil uh, group. And so I got to know some of the people that were always IDing the animals there. So I made friends with them. Um, and then would ask people that had real world field experience with the animals, like, tell me about where you find 
tricolor hognose snakes. Uh, and, and that was actually a lot of fun. Um, one of the things I learned through this process is that the at least the herp community in South America is very much like the herp community in North America, only they're just nicer people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, yeah. there wasn't a single person. There was not a single person that I reached out to that was derogatory, mean. Like I'm, I'm translating to Portuguese from English, and I know that I did some things that were – they had to have read, like, who the hell is this idiot from the States? But, you know, people were very patient, and I learned a lot of just kind of what we would get when we talked to a herper here. Um, so I would do that, and then I would take that, put in spreadsheets, and try to get information there, reached out to scientists – so it didn't matter. I just cast the broadest net I possibly could to get as much information on the natural history because I wasn't – I've never been to South America. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there was any part of this that had a, um imposter syndrome feel to it, it was the fact that I'm a field biologist that wrote a natural history book that hasn't set foot in South America. <laughs> so we are rectifying that. Like I am getting there in the next year or two. I've already told my wife – like I travel a lot for my job. This has to happen. Like I have to go and, mm -hmm. and, and see what the hell I wrote about. But anywho, um, so I did that. And then I, on the herpetoculture side, I reached out to as many herpetoculturalists as I could. I reached out to people in Europe. A lot of these snakes have a pretty strong following in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would reach out to people here in the States. And it was really cool to see the similarities and the differences between the European keepers and the people in the States. I actually reached out to a bunch of people in South America that take care of these animals and, and, and maintain them down there. And it was just getting nugget after nugget after nugget and then keeping it all organized. So I would make spreadsheets, put keywords in the spreadsheet. This is what I do when I'm writing a paper. And then I would put like who told me what, what it was. And then um, I had a notebook. I went old school and I would just make outlines with a pencil so I could erase shift and then mm -hmm. once I got the outlines done, then I had to write. And the writing part was was difficult at times because I am a very busy guy. So I wrote this book all over the eastern United States. <laughs> <laughs> like what was weird is I found that when I had field work, where I could write a lot then because a lot of times we would not start our day until like 8.30, 9 o'clock. Uh, and so – and I'd be out with the students because um, it's not because we're lazy. It's because we were out chasing crawdads until like one in the morning. Right. Two right. In the morning. And so I would like get I learned how to do this with my Ph.D. I would get like four, take a four hour power nap, wake up at like five and then write for four hours and then go out into the mm -hmm. field. But it was never it never felt like drudgery. I mean, at, at times it was kind of a pain in the ass to get all the technicality in order. But I was almost always looking forward to doing it. My wife mm -hmm. had a surgery um, and she she was like, well, I, I do you think you can get a week off? And I was like, yes, yes, I can get a week off. <laughs> um, and so the Urethra Lampras chapter, if you if you get the last <laughs> chapter, I did all the lit review for that while I was in the room with Kathy during her recovery, because um and I, I even say that in the uh, I think it was the acknowledgement section because her surgery didn't go quite so well. So, like, you know, there were parts of that week that were horrible. And mm -hmm. then she would go to sleep. I would kind of calm down a little bit and then I would read, 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 outline, outline, outline. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had a, a, a bunch of field work the following month. And then I just in the morning I would get up early. Uh, but I learned that I write really well from about 530 to nine. And that's when I wrote. So. Very nice. Now, now, I think our, you know, from what you've said, and plus, you know, obviously, a lot of things about the book, I mean, at this point, kind of familiar with, because I mean, we've been talking yeah. about it for ages uh -huh. on, on the podcast, right? So while well, I, I know the answer, was this easier or harder than you were expecting? Oh, my God. P parts of it were actually a little bit easier than I thought. And then parts of it were much more difficult. I don't know if difficult is the right word. Um, tedious is the oh, right word. I was going word. to say it was just more involved than what you may yes. have been anticipating. Um, yeah. The the writing part was actually, in the end, the easiest part. The part of it that was the most difficult, without question, 
was getting two to 300 photographs of these mm-hmm. snakes from South America when my dumb ass has never been to South America. <laughs> <laughs> so like there's a picture of an animal in South America. I didn't take it because I wasn't there. So uh, I didn't know. I, I didn't know the first place to begin to do that. And that's where if I've had a mentor through this and he does not know that I view him as a mentor, it would have to be Justin Julander. Uh, he, he's written the complete carpet Python, complete spotted Python, red green tree Python book. Whenever I would hit like a bottleneck and I'm like, uh, what do I do? I would message, uh, Julander and be like, okay, so how did you get the pictures from the people in Australia? And, you know, that's when he told me, well, go on to Flickr, um, and, and just patrol and try to find as many pictures. And a lot of times people don't put all their pictures on Flickr. And so I found about six, six to eight South American photographers who were just badasses. One of the things I love about the book is the book serves as a vehicle to show off their photography. Right. Uh, and, and they were just great. They, they were, um, they were so excited that somebody was actually going to put their photographs in books. Uh, they, 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 the one guy, this is crazy. So I reached out to him and I needed a picture. I don't remember which species it was, but it was one of the phylodryas, which is what Baron's racers are. Mm-hmm. Cause I was trying to get a picture of every species, which is a very, very tall order. Cause some of these things, there's like two photographs of them on the planet. Uh, and I had reached out to him and then we're doing the, like, I write it in Messenger, copy it, dump it into Google Translator, turn it into Portuguese, send it his way. And then he's sending me the messages in Portuguese. I'm dumping them into English. So like, mm-hmm. I, I, I got real good at that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he said, well, what species do you need photographs of? And, and I thought, you know, it's like somebody asking me for crayfish pictures because I have those. And it, you know, me saying, well, what, what species do you need? And then they say X, Y, Z. And I say, well, I have X, I have Y, but I don't have Z. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like 10 days and he didn't respond to the, you know, I said, I need this one, this one, this one, this one. And then I didn't get a response to that. I didn't think anything of it. Uh, and it's two weeks later and he goes, here you go. I didn't have anything to do over the weekend. So I drove like six hours North to where the snake lives. And I spent wow. three days in the bush trying to find it. And I'm like, what the hell? Wow. <laughs> like, so of course that picture has got to be in there. Um, so, you know, like when I say that the South Americans were fantastic, they were fantastic. And then there were quite a few, um, American photographer people that we know in herpetoculture and, and from field herping that are relatively well known in those circles. Um, Jake Scott, who I introduced myself to via Instagram, um, <laughs> he, there was a trip that he and Mike Pinkleton did to Paraguay. And I was so freaking jealous. It was right in the middle of me writing this. And I was like, oh, God, I hope they find every freaking snake that lives in Paraguay (laughs) because I reached out to Pinkleton ahead of time. And he he told me, like, whatever we get, you can throw in there. And so they 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 crushed it. They got a false water cobra. They got a uh, a Xenodon Paltra, the tricolor hognose snake. Mm -hmm. And they got a Boiruna. So the false Muserana. And if you look on the the opening to each of those paragraphs, I tried to get a really nice lateral picture Mm -hmm. that just kind of shows off the animal and i didn't want it to be from human care i wanted to be a wild one and so jake has like that picture i think for at least three of the chapters nice um if not if not more of them so but the photographs like that's the thing i've learned like with the hognose snakes i've already started grabbing them i've got a little bit of ptsd it's like herping (laughs) just on the internet like and and with that book i'm going to try to get pictures of all the different races and phenotypes and you know platy rhinos the eastern hog is has one of the widest distributions of any snake in north america so getting pictures from every state it lives in is a pretty tall order but yeah um i learned how to organize stuff uh google all i all i did was um i west liberty's emails are google emails so i had a google drive and i just had folders and so many files in those folders and then i would the whole book is on a Google, is in a series of Google folders. And I would then, you know, about once every three days, download that onto an external hard drive uh, just to have a backup for it. But, but yeah, no, but the whole process, 
I, I I tell my wife this like daily. I miss it. I loved it so much. It, like it was everything I've done as an academic. This is what I feel like I was meant to do. Because when you write these journal articles, and anybody listening knows what I'm talking about, it's not. I mean, it's fun to publish a journal article, but it's painful. It is like you spend so much time trying to outsmart a reviewer and then you you submit it to the journal and then it's literally being submitted to a blender like the 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 people mm-hmm. that are reviewing it if they do what they're supposed to do they're going to shred it and poke holes in it and not that I don't mind that process but sometimes you get people in, in my circles they're referred to as reviewer number 2 it's always reviewer number 2 that <laughs> is just questioning everything and you're like what in the actual f like yeah. This is not – and then you have to do like hand-to-hand combat with them to get your idea through. Mm-hmm. And that's what my writing experience had been. And then this was just write a snake nerd book for snake nerds like you, and mm-hmm. I did. And then, you know, Mark O'Shea, he edited it, and he did he did the peer review thing, but he didn't do it in a, in a negative Condescending, way. Condescending, negative yeah. way, yes. He made mm-hmm. the book a better product yes. because this was yes. my first book, and mm-hmm. I have – I don't have an ego in this thing. Like I, I was doing this to learn. That's, and so the fact that Mark did what he did and taught me what I was, you know, kind of led me down some paths I didn't necessarily find on my own. That just made it even better. So, nice. You know, so yeah. much of what you just said there. You know, before I move to another question, first, when you told me Mark O'Shea was going to write yeah. the foreword in this book, I'm like, are you shitting me? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Really, you know what I mean. It's like wow, you know. It's because we had nothing but respect for that man. You know, just wow. You know, it's you're talking about someone who whose name and contributions, you know, to uh, to the science behind it all is just uh, and the brain on that man too. Oh wow. my god, yes, yes. And, and uh, he is. He, say what you want to say about you know, the early Animal Planet personalities Mm -hmm. now we all know whether we want to admit it or not Irwin planted animals um corwin probably planted animals Mm -hmm. it was a little bit over the top when you're jumping through a bush to land Mm -hmm. on a snake like a lot of the i I feel like a lot of the um youtube over the topness may have come from our good friend steve Mm -hmm. but i was a mark o'shea guy when all those people were on at the same time, like mm-hmm. he, he was the guy I was watching. I would, yeah. Crocodile Hunter would come on and I would watch it, do something else. But a new episode of O'Shea's Big Adventure came on and boom, like that was all I was doing yeah. for that yeah. hour. Cause he was a scientist and he treated a show like a scientist. A hundred percent. You know, yeah. the, the three so, you just mentioned, it's like you have the two ends of the spectrum. You know, you have Steve Irwin, who again, I, I love the man because of what he did really yeah. with, you know, catapulting, what we do into such a positive light when it comes to reptiles. But yes, of course, there's a lot of theatrics in it. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, the man's energy was unmatched, you know, yeah. that's just period. Then you have on the other end of the spectrum, Mark O'Shea, who's very mild mannered, very quiet. And like you said, it was much more the science behind it. it it's you're going to get a lot more of the natural history and, you know, in a much more calm, you know, way. Mm-hmm. And I kind of felt like Jeff Corwin's right there in the middle. Yep. You know what I mean? Because he was definitely more science based than what Irwin was. Um, but, you know, bigger personality is, in, you know, a little louder dynamic than what Mark O'Shea was. So he's kind of right there in the middle. Um, you know, they all serve their purpose, but I'm with you. You know, Mark O'Shea's name isn't going to be on the lips of those that are just passively you know, mm-hmm. in the hobby or new into it. But for those of us who've been here for ages, I mean, no doubt. And, and that's, like I said, it's, it's one of those where if you, I will say, if I could meet one of the, <laughs> those that are alive right now, I'm really interested in meeting Jeff Corwin. I really did mm-hmm. like him. Um, I've met Mark O'Shea, you know, once, you know, already have a autograph book by him. Um, but as far as for this book, you know, anyone on the planet to write that foreword, he to me gave the most relevance. You know, it was like that just that's such a powerful hand to have been mm-hmm. placed on that book, you know, when it's this is a, a science based book. So that's uh yeah. So that was awesome. That yeah, yeah. when you told me that I was like, oh my God, Zach, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh the second thing about what you just said there that I thought was really neat and I mean when you talked about the using Google Translator to go back and forth, you know, with this gentleman, uh, you know, in Portu- with uh, the Portuguese, 
How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, really that, uh-huh. you know, not just the technology behind that, but this brought two people that couldn't even communicate under, you know, other circumstances. And for you guys to go through that, that motion to be able to communicate on this shared interest to be able to put oh, this together. Crazy. I just think that's so cool. You know, that that's so neat that it, that it's done that. Oh, and, and when I was in the thick of it, I was a machine with co- select all paste, copy, select all mm-hmm. copy, copy, paste. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, uh, in fact, it was really fun. I, I knew that I was, I had, I'd figured out how to do that when the guy, one of the, one of the other photographers was like, you speak excellent Portuguese. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, hey, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, That's I'm good awesome. at copying and pasting. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. well, it, it, the, the other <laughs> piece, funny. you know, when you were talking about the feeling of doing this mm-hmm. and, you know, I, what it sounds like to me, and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's kind of two feelings at the same time. You're seeing the kind of the, the end result of so much that you, and I don't mean just the process of writing a book. I'm saying, all the time of studying these animals, all the, the learning, all, you know, the, the, the nuance that, you know, yep. all these pieces. So it's kind of like an, you know, the accumulation of all this knowledge in yourself. So you almost feel like you've reached the end of a road. Like, you know, you've, you're now the expert on it, but then through the process of the book, you grew. Oh yeah. Everything you learned in the process too. So it's like, Get it, you know, I, I guess it, to me, it'd be almost like being in the Olympics, right? To even get to the Olympics, you have to think about how hard you work to get there and, and how far developed you are. But then to get the gold, that extra push, mm-hmm. that, you know, that growth that just happened on that. So um, that, that was just neat, man. Hearing all that was just really cool. Well, what was crazy is you know, when I made the decision to write the book a lot, I, t- I tell my students this all the time. I I was confident enough and my knowledge to know that I did not know anything close to what I was going to know when I was done. Mm-hmm. But I knew that I was capable of learning it. And I knew that I had the skill set to take that and assimilate it into a product for other people, you know, to learn from. And mm-hmm. that should be the point of this whole endeavor. But at no point did I, and, and even to this day, I, I still have a hard time with it, but, but you just were used the word expert. I don't know if I'm there yet, I don't feel like I can even remotely utter that term with this group of snakes until I've stepped foot in South America 30 times. Mm -hmm. Like the guys in South America, to me, you know, definitely worthy of that moniker. You know, but Um, to be honest with you, Zach, I think that for guys like us, we never consider ourselves experts on something. We will consider ourselves knowledgeable. (laughs) You know, we'll consider ourselves maybe the most knowledgeable in the room at times on a certain subject. But we've been proven wrong by ourselves so many times mm-hmm. that to to say to say we're an expert on something i just don't know if we have it in us even if others you know give that word give you that. Know, at times yeah so, but wow. but yeah no it's been that was without question the best part but i was not just go back to it one more time flipping pictures i had stress <laughs> dreams about the pictures i'd have stress dreams about writing um i i wanted to find so badly a picture of um, Herman's water snake, uh, Hydrodynasties by Synctus. It's the other false water cobra. And all the pictures online were kind of garbage for, for this level of effort. And then there was this one photographer and he had them on Flickr. And like the level of effort I put forward to get that, to get a hold of that guy to talk to him. I mean, it, it, it qualified as grade A stalking. Like I did, I went on social media. I messaged him <laughs> Flickr. I was like, all right, who's liking these pictures? This guy's liked it nine times. Can I get a hold of him? And then I tried to get a hold of that. I mean, it, it was it was a little bit nutty what I did. But when I <laughs> when I finally got him to respond, and he he just like all the awesome people from South America, was like, use any picture you want. Um, just give me credit. And I was like, of course I'm gonna give you credit, man. Um, but but just having like like those little victories, when I go through the book, somebody might just go, bloop, it's a brown snake with a black stripe. But that's the fun part of it is like I know that I spent six weeks trying to get that stupid picture. Right, of, right. You know, uh, and I also know when I get to that Philodryas picture, like this is the one the guy went on a literal field excursion <laughs> right. to get. 
a, a picture of. And it was, and in that case, you know, it wasn't the best photograph. It didn't matter. It was going in the book. Like you, mm-hmm. you put forward that effort for me. It, you know, that's a big deal. So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So it was rewarding. Now, um, the other part that I wasn't quite prepared for was getting it ready to get published and then getting it published. Uh, and so the way that would work is you know, I would send it off to Russ, who's we have to give Russ some mad props because he was awesome to work with and has been awesome to work with even now and getting the book out and everything. But then we would like take that. He would lay it out and then we have to read it and make sure like everything's italicized, everything's right. And then we would send that off to Mark and then O'Shea would then find like the most minuscule typos. Like he was so good at this. Like one of the, one of the things that he found a lot of, which Russ and I still to this day laugh about wasn't a typo. It was, there was an extra space between (laughs) words. So there's not a like, It's not that the words are wrong. There's one extra space there. I want you to think about that for a second, Mm. you know? And and so he would say, Hey, yeah. Highlight it with with, with the PDF function and be like, get rid of the space. Uh, Because he's written so many books. I mean, I have, I'm Mm -hmm. looking at two of them right now on my desk. So Mm -hmm. having him there, but that whole like last deal, it was this time last year that we thought we were finishing it and we didn't get it completely finished formatted tied up with a little bow until January. So do the math, you know, it was an extra four months, but it was worth it. So I, I concur with you there, at least from (laughs) a, you know, a uh, consumer end, you know, uh, you know, know, talking about that, the consumer end, and you mentioned, you know, natural history earlier. So I guess one of my questions is, so what category of nerd (laughs) will this appeal to? I mean, is this a, a natural history book with some husbandry or is this a husbandry book with natural history? So that is a that is a fantastic question because I kept asking myself that over and over and over again. It 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 has to be both. If I if I had to break it down the middle, I, I would say it depends on the chapters. Um, but I tried to make it fifty by fifty fifty, maybe sixty forty. Husbandry is always going to be the primary focus of the chapters because that if there was any area that I had. Leg- you know, some expertise in Mm -hmm. it's that because I've obviously kept the animals Mm -hmm. um, and I've bred all the animals and I've raised all the animals. Uh, So, you know, I knew what I was doing and the initial intent of writing the book was that to make a husbandry book that had some natural history. But in the end, I, I wrote this book for the 20 year old version of me. Like that was the target audience. I I knew what I always wanted a book on. I knew Mm -hmm. that when I was taking care of monitor lizards, for example, I, I had the monitor lizards that I chose to take care of like doom rolls and roughnecks and ornate Niles and like all the rando weird monitors that I kept. I kept them because I knew about their biology and natural history. And that's what made me want to keep them. And I had, I published a paper um, that, natural history using natural history information as a framework for husbandry and i thought there's not a better place to just go absolutely insane with that paper than this book and so that's exactly what i did so i took that paper and that is the model for every one of the chapters is what that paper was uh and so in doing that that basically means that you've got to learn as much about the natural history because the natural history is what's going to dictate your husbandry practice Uh, and so i basically went full full bore on you know that so in the end Mm -hmm. it's probably a 50 50 now that first chapter it doesn't have a damn thing to do with husbandry it's all it's actually systematics taxonomy explaining what the hell a dipsatid is um let's say that that seems like it's you know good place to start yeah right yeah and i thought if i'm really gonna like promote these animals to herpetoculturalists and slip some science in there as an educator this is where i'm gonna do it so um, most of the animals covered in depth in that chapter, they're not even in herpetoculture. And I don't know if they should be ultimately in herpetoculture, some of them, because they're just so specialized. Um, but no, in, in, you know, I could see herpetology nerds liking the book. I could see herpetoculturalists liking the book. And if you're a nice. field herper and a herpetoculture person, the book is like, it's definitely for you because that's basically gotcha. what I am. So, so. I, I don't want you to go into this because if you if you tell me yes, then what I would tell our listeners is go buy the book. 
Um, <laughs> you know, or, or listen for a future episode where we get into some details. But so you, on the herpticultural side, because obviously yep. one of the things that uh, we talk so much on this program, it's not just temps, cages, humidity, and all this. Do you go into nuance? Oh, do, hell do yeah. Touch on th- yes, yes, yes. There's See, lots of that in there. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and that I, that's those are the books that I just eat up, you know, because mm-hmm. that's that's the hands-on. That's the things you yep. don't you don't get on a care sheet. So no. Uh, well, you know, well, this is the anti-care sheet herpetoculture book. So yes. what I did, and I have been doing it since, is like I I'm not gonna name names on this, but there are herpetoculture books that I bought that I was super excited to get. And then I got them and they were just a complete letdown, like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. such generalized stuff that it reads like a care sheet. And if it's a book, I feel like you need to up level that if you're going to actually have a book. Uh, And so what I started doing is basically I built a library during this process because I have every intention of keeping this trend alive. And so the books that I like the most are the complete guides too. So we had Dusty on here. I bought the complete mm-hmm. Subok and yep. read it cover to cover. Uh, obviously the Marilia Bible, the complete carpet and the more complete carpet, more complete had just come out when we were finishing editing this. Um, the complete boa, the more complete boa constrictor, those. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also knew that I didn't want to take this thing overly serious because if I wrote it in a super technical super serious way i'm gonna lose people like right uh, you know i and and the point is to get people as jazzed about these things as i am and so mm-hmm. the complete chondro i think that's it and the more complete chondro if you read those yeah. the the kind of author's voice in there maxwell writes that in yeah, a very yeah. conversational way but it's also going into zoogeography and taxonomy and you know, mm-hmm. you know, all that good stuff and so if there was any book that influenced me a lot, it was those two, because I really yeah. liked that voice. Uh, yeah. and, and so I basically, in the end, chose to write like the, the tone of voice that is in the book is the tone I use when I am teaching upper level mm-hmm. undergrads. Like that's basically where where I ultimately landed. And to get that took a long ass time because I had written all those journal articles on crayfish And uh, that is very technical. And that was like my default. And you're taking all the motion out and you're not talking about what you like. And it's very black and white. Mm -hmm. And um, the first couple drafts of things when I wrote them, uh, my wife is my biggest critic. And I told her, like, brutalize this. And she did. (laughs) (laughs) I gave her the first draft of that Musarana chapter. And Kathy was like, no. No one's going to like this. This yeah. is uppity. It's snotty. It, I mean, she did not pull punches. And I was like, well, tell me how you really feel. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to start completely over again. And then I just basically found out a way that I could, like, you know, kill everything I had been taught writing scientifically and kind of get that Discover Magazine feel, you know, Nat Geo mm-hmm. feel. Like, that's kind of the way that I wanted it to be written. Kind of find the balance between Dr. Loman and Zach. Let exactly. them both have well, their voice in there. It's funny yeah. you say that because Dr. Zach wrote the book. There you go. I love <laughs> it. I, yes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I try to get the people around here to call me Dr. Zach and they won't because that's more reflective of who I actually am. So, mm-hmm. um, but that's exactly what it was because I can geek out like anybody. And, you know, you can tell when I geek out. Um, and I just, you know, unbridled enthusiasm went for it. And now there's a book. Nice. I love it, man. Mm -hmm. So false water cobras, Baron's racers, you know, they make complete sense being in the book because, you know, they they're in the hobby, right? You know, they may not be all over the place, which makes me like them even more, but they're they're prevalent. They're out there. Right. Um, So what about the other groups? You know, what made you throw because I I, what is it? uh, The Musaranas, the um, the other two. like the tricolor hognose uh, snakes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then you know, the so, real oddballs, which are Eurythra lamprus laophis. Yes, yeah, a, yeah. Name. So, you know, what made you throw the extras, you know, in sure. there? Uh, well, two of them are pretty easy to explain. Um, Musaranas definitely have a 
a cult following mm-hmm. in herpetoculture. Uh, a lot of people, they see moose. I did this. I'm fully guilty of this. Um, they see muserana and they think about the big giant museranas from Costa Rica and, and Peru. And, and that's a species of snake called Clelia clelia. And it can be to be like, it's an eight foot monster. Mm-hmm. The, the, they are incredibly difficult to keep in human care. We kind of import them to die. I do not recommend them as a species to take to ever try to work with. I had one gifted to me and it was a royal pain in the ass to take care of. And it ultimately ended up passing in the end. Um, but the, the, the species of Muserana that is in the in herpetoculture is called Boiruna maculata. It's sometimes called the false Muserana. It's a really cool snake. It's a, it, it's basically the king snake of the dipsadids. That's it eats other snakes it's mm-hmm. probably the strongest constricting snake that I've ever worked with. And, and you know how when you feed a king, they do that like whip and then they're immediately yep. like a pine cone, like perfect yeah. coil. Mm-hmm. The only other snake I've seen do that are nice. Oruna. And then there's a, a really interesting thing about them in herpetoculture. There's a pied Muserana. Yep. And that is one of the few natural occurring morphs in nature. The, there are populations of Boiruna in Paraguay and Uruguay where – 30 to 40% of the animals you encounter in the field are pied. They're black mm-hmm. and white. Cause that kind of is a, it ends up being a really cool way for them to be camouflaged at night. So I knew that they kind of had a following and then I had pursued them because they were related to the, to the false water cobras. Uh, and I thought it would be cool to give them some love uh, because if people buy the book for the false water cobras or the bear and I, you can't help but see the other species. And then you end up seeing those pied moosey so museranas were in there i included another one the brown muserana uh parasimophis rustica uh they are incredibly rare i actually have a male right up there um i've seen his shadow yeah. moving while yes. we <laughs> uh-huh. he's they're just a brown snake they're you know that's all they are unless you know about their biology and they're super cool mm-hmm. so listeners you ever find a female i'm your guy jen joseph's the only person i know that has them um in the in the states but uh so i included rusticus because they're really easy to take care of and they're just a cool snake and if we can get them established in herpetoculture we don't need to import them anymore and most of these are cites species anyway so they're not going to be imported anymore so if we get them from europe i thought it would be cool to kind of get people to know they exist and then you know maybe we can get a north american population the tricolor hognose snake is easy Anybody that's seen a tricolor hog immediately falls in love with tricolor hogs. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. People make the fatal mistake of assuming they're just a hog no snake. They are not. They are from a completely different lineage of dipsatid snakes. Um, and I go to great length to explain all the reasons why they are not a true hog no snake. Um, but that's a species that's receiving a lot of attention right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's receiving attention in Europe, and there's lines in Europe we don't have. And now yeah, that chapter is probably obsolete. Uh, because in just in the past year, the hypo E morphs have kind of exploded. There's a high black morph that's exploded. There's some genetics that are being figured out. But there's actually three tricolored hognose snakes in South America. So I kind of go over all those. Um, nice. And so I thought, this is a snake that's going to be in herpetoculture for a long time. So we'll include a chapter on it. And then the third group I included because I just want people to give a crap about them. <laughs> like, like they're so freaking cool uh and they're we all talk well we always talk about like this species of snake is not conducive for herpetoculture because of abc this species of snake is not conducive for herpetoculture because of one two three this group of snakes they're imported fairly frequently because they're some of them are common um they equilibrate to garter snakes where they occur so they're they're not rare and they are fantastic snakes if you like to do naturalistic bioactive keeping we mm-hmm. talk about on this podcast all the time that doing bioactive with snakes can be a pain in the butt. This group lends themselves just like garter snakes do. And that would be – they were in the, the genus Lyophis for a real long time, one of the most speciose genera in South America, like 40 different species. And then somebody does a genetic study and finds out that they're actually very closely related to this other genera and they should be in that genera. And since that genera was named first – they move from Lyophis into this genus called Eurythra lampris. Eurythra lampris had four species. So that genera went from like four to 44 in a paper. And so um, in Europe, people keep 
but I call them Lyophis in the book. You can call them Erythrolampras. I don't care. They're just cool. Uh, <laughs> but they keep several species in, in, in uh, Europe. We have almost had them go extinct in our captive population here wow. in the States. Uh, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to just basically write a chapter. And that was my kind of plea as a herpetoculturalist to be like, you know, you've got your ball pythons, you've got your corn snakes, you've got all these morphs. I've heard lots of people on podcasts talk about just pick one oddball thing and work with it to establish it. Uh, and um, while I was writing the chapter, what was really cool is one of these things is called Eurythrolampris typhlus. It's the velvet swamp snake. Mm-hmm. And I started buying every velvet swamp snake I could find in like 2019, 2020. And it got to the point where in, in social media circles, one would pop up on Morph Market Fauna, even with Underground, and like people knew, tell Zach. And so <laughs> I was buying them all. They weren't overly cheap, and they put a dent in my checkbook. And what kept happening with them, they were all imports, and they would do great and then crash. <sighs> and it wasn't like a slow burn. It was like I figured out how to get them to eat. That's in the book. Turns out these things will eat readily if you just gently hold them and like kind of if you get the pinky into their mouth or the fuzzy, they grab it and they swallow it. Mm-hmm. it. It doesn't matter where they are. And so I was able to do that. And then they would crash and burn and I couldn't get a female. And so I had a million males. No, sorry. I had that backwards. I had a bunch of females. I couldn't get a male. And I had reached that point that all of us reach where I was like, F this. Mm-hmm. I'm done. And no joke the the week I made that decision, um, one of the people, Ivory Exotics, messaged me and was like, do you want these? He just came in. And I said, no, I think I'm done for a little while. And somebody else, first Velvet Swamp Snakes they ever owned, they bought them both. It was a freaking pair. And they made it immediately and laid eggs. And now we have like, we have one clutch of Velvet Swamp Snakes in, the, in herpetoculture right now. Um, Glenn Brooks has some of them. Yeah, but I, say, I knew Glenn had them. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you know, and now that they're in capable hands, watch them take off because I promise you they will be just like garter snakes. And the thing about this genus that people don't know is they are productive as hell. Once they get fertilized, it is not at all uncommon for them to do what the tricolors are famous for, and they will drop a clutch of eight, nine eggs, and then a month later they'll drop 10 more eggs, and then the, a, a month later they will drop 12 eggs, um, uh, Spitfire Reptiles, yes, sir. Mustafa, sorry if I said that wrong, yes, sir. He's the only person I know of that has a pair. And the first time he bred them, he ended up with like 40 of them. And I ended up getting a bunch of them from him and, and you know, was raising those. Those weren't typhlus. Those were yellow belly Lyophis. Uh, so this is a, you know, that's kind of an appreciation chapter to get people to really, to just realize they exist because they're, freaking awesome when i had them and i kept them in exos uh with branches and you know live plants and water features and they're out they're just like a garter snake only they don't do the live birth um they fill the same niche they're fantastic animals i actually don't have any more now and and of all the animals in the book i i have all the other species um mine crashed and i think i got a and i'm willing to say this because we're teaching um i i had some kind of virus hit my collection and it 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 took out the lyophis and it took out um a couple of my hognose snakes that i had Mm -hmm. at my house so i know that it was a dipsadid centric thing uh but like you know that's another reason why we should have these things in multiple collections because had i had them all at the time like had i bought every typhlus we wouldn't have typhlus so right but that's definitely something that the I'm I'm keen on promoting them even more. Uh, and so, yeah, great, great group of snakes. I love it, man. Well, now, it, you know, maybe it, it's them, although you've already kept them. During your – during the process of, you know, studying all this and studying all these species, so ha- have any – has there been a species that's come up through this that now you feel like I have to work with that? You yeah. know, one that you hadn't messed with before that now you're like, mm-hmm. that that's coming to Zach. Yeah. And it's the one that's probably the ugliest of all of them. It's that, <laughs> it's that brown moose behind me. Um, 
I ever ever since I started doing this, I only take I only keep things that I find incredibly interesting. And the thing that I found so interesting about this big brown snake, uh, that's what a brown muserana is in, in a nutshell, is its biology is super cool because it occurs at like mid latitudes in South America. And then it goes down into Argentina. So this is a snake. That's like a temperate colubrid here in North America. So it fills a very similar niche. And being that it's a muserana, museranos are just powerful, strong, badass snakes. And I like king snakes for the same reason. I like mm-hmm. my false water cobras. And since it's kind of the other muserana, uh, I, I kind of made my mind up that, I was going to get them, and when I got them, I was going to hold on to them. And the, my my good, I guess, social media friend with Herpeticulture, Matt Dove, he got them somehow. I don't know how the hell he found them, and I didn't. And I was so freaking jealous that he got this mail. <laughs> I was like, you son of a bitch. Like, how did you even find – like, I had feelers out, and you got one. So he also made me feel bad about myself. Uh, so, <laughs> And then – um. I was I was, you know, doing what we do and I saw that he was entertaining the idea of getting rid of it. And I was just it was one of those mo- we all have this moment where we're just like, this is gonna hurt. <laughs> but give me the price and it's happening. And so it ended up being less than I thought it was gonna be, which was nice. And now I've had that snake for a year, but I've not seen a single female anywhere. Um, like I said. Jen Joseph has them. I haven't reached out to Jen, but I'm I'm probably going to be doing that shortly. And she's the only person I know of that's bred them in the States. Uh, mm. and, and, and so this is a species that could be established in private herpeticulture here in, in, in North America. They're doing fine in, in South America. Like one of the things I like about all of these species, currently none of them are like in rare or endangered or mm-hmm. in any danger, in any major consequence of extinction. Uh, and, but I just want to esta- – I think it's important that we get them in human care and establish populations with legally obtained stock because we can't ever get false water cobras again. There are these two species. You can't export animals. Brazil is essentially Australia. You can't export animals out mm-hmm. of Brazil. Um, and, and, and so well, we've established the Museranas, the Boiruna here. We have fi- – Baron is not going anywhere. False water cobras breed like rabbits. They're mm-hmm. here to stay. But some of these other species that are covered in the book, I'd love it if we could just establish North American lines. And so the brown muserana would be the one for me. Uh, and and I, like I said, I've got the mail. I just need to get my hands on some girls. So <laughs> I have faith, buddy. I'm, I'm yes. pulling for mm-hmm. Yep. So, you know, obviously my, my first assumption, you know, with the question I'm about to ask you is, you know, being that the book has now been wrapped up and, Um, you know, through the process now of of getting it out there and letting everybody know about it. I'm assuming the first thing you're going to do is take a breath, right? You know, (laughs) after, after the the years of putting it in there, but what's next, what's next for Dr. Zach? Uh, well, the, the fall is all about my students. So I am not writing. All right. So I say I'm not writing. I'm, I started writing a book chapter today on false water cobras for an aquatic snake book that's coming out. So I'm writing, let's be real, but I'm not doing big projects, but I I have to take the fall and dedicate it to my students 100% because I have a bunch of them that somehow they all ended up getting to a point where they can graduate in the fall and I got to get them out. And that is a very time consuming process, Mm -hmm. reviewing their theses and and doing all that. So that is the immediate goal, but my reward for doing that. uh, And I also have to write, you know, I can't forget about the crawdads. So I have some crayfish papers I'm writing this fall, but I'm setting up the stage where beginning in January, um, it is hog nose snakes throttle down. Yeah. So, uh, I, I did, I, I knew that I needed to get out into the field before I started writing. So that's why I took on the graduate student who's doing the field based herpeticulture. That's not an accident. Uh, thesis on <laughs> hog <hogging laughs> snakes. That's very self-serving. I'll fully admit to that. Um, and so I've been out in the field and, uh, that's, what's going to make the hog book a very different book than this book, because I had to write about what other people experienced in the field. Right, right with these snakes 
the complete guide to hognose snakes is going to be my experiences in the field plus other people's. And then it's almost like it's flipped a little bit because with this book, it was like I had the expertise in the herpetoculture and I had to go to other people for the field. Mm -hmm. I'm doing my bread and butter. So I get to be a field biologist, naturalist, ecologist, herpetologist, whatever the hell you want to call it for the natural history ecology part of the heterodon book. And then I can do the husbandry to I'm blue in the face, but I am not a morph person. And you cannot write a book on hognose snakes without the morphs. I, mm -hmm. I'm not an idiot. People want that book to understand what the morphs are, understand mm -hmm. how to make them. So this is where I'm going to be reaching out. And I've already kind of started and I've had some awesome listeners to this podcast um, reach out to me about this. But I have to learn all these hognose snake morphs. And I went on the morph market and they have the morphopedia or whatever the hell they call it. And, you know, I know what an Arctic is and a conda and a sable. And and I was like, well, I just want to see what the hell I'm getting into. And then I read that and was like, oh, dear God. In heaven. There, there's a lot. There's, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, man, I, like, I get it, buddy. I've, <laughs> so, well, uh, so. You know, like I've told you how popular hog nose, you know, have gotten around here. So, you know, first get mm -hmm. some normals in people like that. Then they're one albinos and then but they're wanting more morphs. And so I'm starting to look into it and I'm with you, man. I'm like, Oh gosh, man. It's yeah, like no. trying to learn ball pythons. You know what yep. I mean? It's wow. No, you know? I, I just bought the new, uh, Kevin McCurley has a new ball Python manual. It's part of the complete series. Mm -hmm. And all that book really is, is just explanation after explanation after explanation of the morphs. Yeah. And that book is two and a half inches thick. So I don't know how we're going to handle this uh for the hognose snake book but you know it's almost like there needs to be volume one volume two mm -hmm. where there's the natural history and husbandry and then there's a second book that's the morphs but i don't think um i don't think i can convince bob ashley of that so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know i i've got to figure that whole piece out but i'm actually looking forward to it i've i've I, I do like some of the hognose morphs and, and we've had some happy accidents happen here. Uh, I we've acquired a lot of hognose snakes from people and we were breeding them this year just to get more hognose snakes. You're getting some of those. Yeah. Um, we're going to keep some of them for experiments and I we're, we're popping out super condas and this patternless animals. And then like, crazy crap that i can't talk about but some hognose breeder would look at and immediately know what the hell it is <laughs> uh, so uh i you know in in doing that i was like yeah this is kind of fun so i don't mean to i'm not putting my nose up to the morphs i'm just simply saying i am a busy guy and that is going to take a large amount of time mm -hmm. <laughs> to, yeah. to figure out so i'm a visual learner so i imagine that i will be inviting myself to some pretty large hognose snake collections and just seeing <laughs> if somebody's willing to point these things out and explain them to me but Next year, it's, it's that. And then I still take this thing full circle. I got that sabbatical in 2016 to write The Crayfishes of West Virginia. That book's still not written. So <laughs> I am going to take 2024, draft out the natural history and the husbandry part of the Hognose book. And then 2025 is when I'm going to just go full in on the morphs. And I also have to write the crayfish book. We have three species in West Virginia I still have to name before we can finish that book. So I'm actually glad that that sabbatical got tanked in the end. Um, so I'm busy. Uh, but, you know, I feel blessed because this is all stuff I want to do. So I busted my ass to get to the point where mm -hmm. my free time can be spent doing these things. So um, it is what it is. But yeah, no, 2024 is the year of the hognose. So if you're a listener and you like that, we will be having hognose breeders on in 2024 as well. And just like the graduate student who's working on that, that is a very self-serving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to you want to do hogs, too. So it makes yeah, sense. Absolutely. Um, it's research, man. Yeah. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, look at it like that. Well, OK, so this is going to be kind of a complete spin, you know, from you, you know, you know from the book. Um going to be off topic it's, it's going to be the final question um and it's i'll say it like this before i give away the question because as soon as i say something you're gonna know what it is you just sent out something to the hobby that will benefit the hobby i mean mm -hmm. because 
these are – the information in this book is something that you're not going to find anywhere else. And I mean we can say that about, about most books. But what I'm saying is the species that you get into, you can't find this kind of information on. Right, you can't find the nuance on false water cobras, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're reading in groups, right, in Facebook groups. That's where you get yeah. that kind of info. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that what I what I love is you've just injected into the hobby something that's going to make it better, right? Something that's going. So my question for you, Zach, and this may be the first time that you've actually been the one on the receiving end of this question, in honor of our friend Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> My friend, Zach, where, where do you see the future of the hobby going? I – now I feel bad for every person we've asked this question. <laughs> With them not expecting <laughs> it, right? Yeah. Just, it's so for our um, listeners, now you know mm -hmm. he didn't get – he didn't – just didn't. like anybody else. I told him I'm not sharing an outline. Mm -hmm. Nobody. You're, you're going to be just uh, – um, just as surprises everyone. It, it is completely dependent on our own. Mm -hmm. That that is my answer. Uh, I feel hopeful. I would say that I feel hopeful. I think a lot of times the loudest voice in the room is the voice that is heard, and they, we definitely have actors that are very loud or boisterous, and I don't think they represent culture in the light that I want culture to be represented in. Mm -hmm. I can flat out tell you that there are definitely people that are considered standards in culture that I don't want to be associated with at all. And mm -hmm. if I would have said that a year or two ago, I would have put the caveat of like, I don't mean to sound uppity. I don't think I'm sounding uppity. I don't think these people represent me at all. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was on Project Herpetoculture with um, Phil and Roy, and, and and they asked me about herpetoculture, and I talked about herpetoculture being a discipline. And to me, it is it is a discipline. It, you know, I, I I don't have any problems with people saying hobby, and at the same time, I do, because when you talk about a hobby, when you refer to this as a hobby, you don't need a hobby to live. You, you, a hobby is what you do with your spare time. I would argue, Clint. This is not a hobby for you anymore. No, fair, fair <laughs> point, buddy. I'm it, like, this, like touche. I call yeah. it a hobby all the time because yeah. it's been ingrained in me. But you're absolutely you know, right. You're you're up leveling, and I feel like if everybody just strive to up level a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit. We don't have to be have bioactive this and be giving things enrichment to the point that we're tearing our houses down and building jungles in our living room. Like, I don't think we have to do that. I think that that's another extreme end, but if we all just tried to do better, we viewed it as a discipline and a hobby, a hobby can be a discipline, you know, that, that, that that's the same thing. But if, if you view it through that lens, you're going to take it a little bit more serious and you're going to respect it more. And if we respect her for the culture, we're not going to be running around acting like idiots in a public forum. We're going to mm -hmm. do what we can to make it have, a face that then is respected. And if we could do that, I feel like a lot of our perceived threats, they're not going to go away, but they might change in intensity. And, and that's what, what worries me about the private sector. Cause I go to reptile shows and it's, I see things in reptile shows where I'm like, man, I wish this is what people saw when they talk about a reptile show and then mm -hmm. I go to other reptile shows and I'm like, I don't want anybody to ever see this. <laughs> this, you know, this is morally horrific right? to me, you know, mm -hmm. but, but if, if, if the listeners of our show, and I think that we have people that listen to our show that want to respect her for the culture, mm -hmm. they come here to learn. We have guests on here for us to learn. Let's be real. hundred um, percent. Yes. And so if, if you know, you're learning, you're adding to your discipline, you're going to represent this discipline the way that we should. And if we do that, I feel like herpetoculture has a place. Uh, I think that the other thing that people need to do is be patient with each other. I'm a, I am a lifetime learner and a lifetime educator. And I, I can flat out say, you know, if I run out my students when they fail the test with the first thing out of my mouth is like, well, you're an idiot. 
Mm -hmm. Why the hell would you even think to put that answer down? Like, imagine if any of your teachers, your professors, your mentors led with that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do anything to help anyone, Mm -hmm. but you can still give criticism and lift up simultaneously. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, And the people that do that, I have bad respect for. That's what Mark O'Shea did with me. Um, he he could have, when he read parts of that book, been like, what is this hot garbage? Uh, but he didn't. And because it wasn't hot garbage. He, it, you know, it was me trying to do this for the first time. Because I had a mentor, I came out of it the other end. So the, the final thing I will say is I would also like to see, I, I, I'm hopeful for Herbert Culture, if we start engaging people as people. You've said this before. We have to come up with ways to meet, and we're all animal people, and I can flat out tell you the worst thing (laughs) for me is social interaction. Like a lot of – I've had people say to me, like, I don't understand how you could possibly be an introvert. Watch me at a wedding. That's nightmare fuel for me. I don't want to be at the freaking wedding. Um, You know, at my own damn wedding in the reception, I snuck out and looked for great tree frogs. (laughs) (laughs) My wife to this day still talks about that. Like we lost you and I was just completely overwhelmed. But even with that, you know, I I feel like we need to come up with avenues for like-minded people to meet. And that's where going to shows like Tinley and and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, but like the international herpetological symposium, IHS, I'm going to be plugging the living snot out of that thing for the next, uh, however many months, because it was amazing. Because for like three days, I hung out with reptile nerds that ranged from curators and museums to literally 14-year-olds where I felt like I was looking at me when I was in eighth grade. And everybody in between. Mm-hmm. And that was the way it used to be. Um, mm-hmm. and, and social media, you know, I'm a zenial. Uh, it's it's not the same as interacting with people face-to-face. No, so no, not at all. I think we have to come up with ways to do that. Like, I, I give mad props to people like Eric who and Owen who put on Carpet Fest. You know, um, that's a that's a great avenue. Uh and and we have to do that. The Daytona show is kind of cool. The the Herpetoculture podcast peeps or the THP network guys, mm-hmm. they all get together, you know, once a year and just have one on one interaction. So that's how you make a community. If you kind of wrap all that up and we do that, I am I'm hopeful for herpetoculture. If we've got people on YouTube going to India and playing snow slow mode while they're being bit by a Cobra and then taking away resources from people in India that need those resources. Cause they're being bit by Cobras walking right. across the kitchen. Like, come on. Like we just mm-hmm. don't need any of that part of my language bullshit. So I want to treat it like a discipline. And I think if we do that and we educate people and we come together as a legitimate community, I think we're going to be here for a long ass time. So there you go. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Yes. I have a mic here. I could drop it, but it would sound horrible <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> I love it, Zach. Excellent points, my friend. And I mean, I, I think you know that from our time together, we we are so aligned uh-huh. in, in that vision and that thought, even in our conversations before the shows and yep. you know, messages in between. So um great point. Great point. Um I, I want to take a, the opportunity again to congratulate you on the completion thank of the you. book uh, to thank you for letting me to get my hands on it as quick mm-hmm. as I have. Um, it's, it's awesome, man. It, yep. It's awesome. And uh, you know, so proud of you, buddy. Thank so, you. Um, with that, um, Zach, I'm actually, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, you, you've always got the wrap up, you know, for us <laughs> here at the end. Uh, I'll forget to thank somebody or, or you know, one of those pieces. Sure. So, uh, so Zach, uh, man, great episode. Um, uh, a lot of good information and man, I always love it when we just get to chat yep. like this, you know, it feels mm-hmm. so good. So, um, you know, thank you for uh, the book. Thank you for your contributions, you know, to, uh, the discipline thank you. Of, of reptile keeping. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, my friend. Sure. So, um, if you need to get a hold of me, if you want a copy of the book, uh, feel free to just message me directly. A lot of people have done that. So you can message me on Facebook. You can message me on Instagram. So it is uh, middle of September. Uh, we, I know that Russ and I are out of the signed and numbered copies. So those are done, but we still have some hardbacks and we have plenty of softbacks. 
and I will be at Tinley. So if you have the book, it's not signed. You're going to Tinley. Bring it. I'll sign it. Doesn't cost anything. I just want to meet you. I'll be well. And if you come to Tinley, you can pick up copies of the book there, though I don't know if there'll be hardbacks left by that point in time. Um, so there's, you know, there's that thing. And just message me. Don't be bashful. And I will try to get back to you probably late at night because that's when I can do that. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me otherwise, um, Dr. Crawdad on Instagram, Facebook, Zach Loafman. And then to get a hold of Clint, where do they go? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Clint Bartley, or uh, on our Metazotics Facebook page. Uh, you can also email me at metazotics at gmail.com. Uh, you can see all the goodies we have available at metazotics.com. And uh, as a just a friendly reminder for all of our listeners, if you use the code CC radio on metazotics.com, it will save you 5% off of anything. Yep. And then the final thing I want to do is I want to thank you, Clint. I want to thank our listeners. I want to thank the herpetocultural community because if y'all didn't exist, I don't have an audience to write this book for. <laughs> and I'm very proud to be a herpetoculturalist. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I got to contribute back to the community that I love so much. So with that, whatever time of day it is, morning, afternoon, or night, hope you're having a good one. And later. Later.